people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show with India, which recently pledged with the leading nations of the world to cut its emissions to net zero by 2070. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi is one of the more than 120 leaders to have gathered in Glasgow for the COP26 summit. He also visited Rome for the G20 summit on climate change. Climate change is a global concern which enforces the world powers to join hands and work towards reducing the emissions. In Glasgow, the leaders of some of the world's biggest economies and emitters took to the stage to announce pledge and call for further action during the United Nations COP26 climate summit. Many leaders announced commitments to cap emissions from oil and gas production and boost to climate financing until 2025. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced five goals for his country, including a target of reaching net zero emissions by 2070, two decades later than what scientists say is needed to avoid the worst effects of climate change. Pahla, Bharat 2030 tak apni non fossil energy capacity ko 500 gigawatt tak pohunchayega. Dusra, Bharat 2030 tak apni 50% energy requirements renewable energy se puri karega. Tisra, Bharat ab se lakar 2030 tak ke cool projected carbon emission mein 1 billion ton ki kami karega. Chotha, 2030 tak Bharat apni arthi vavastha ki carbon Intensity ko 45% se bhi kam karega. Aur paanchwa, vars 2070 tak Bharat net zero ka laks hasil karega. Ye panchamrat climate action mein Bharat ka ek abhutpurva yogdaan honge. Scientists say the world needs to have global emissions by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050 to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Delayed by a year because of the COVID-19 pandemic, COP26 aims to keep alive the 1.5 degree target. First of all, we have to give strong commitments to reduce emissions by 2030. Net zero by 2050 is good, but it's not enough. We need real action during this decade now. For Europe, this minus 55% at least implemented and delivered. Second, we need to agree to a robust framework of rules, for example, to make global carbon markets a reality. Put a price on carbon. Nature cannot pay that price anymore. Number three, we must mobilize climate finance for supporting vulnerable countries to adapt and leapfrog to clean growth. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres told world leaders the humanity was digging its own grave with an addition to fossil fuels. He said greater ambition and action was needed to keep the goal of holding average temperature rises to 1.5 degrees Celsius, a level scientists say would avoid the most destructive consequences of global warming. The science is clear. We know what to do. First, we must keep the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius alive. This requires greater ambition on mitigation and the immediate concrete action to reduce global emissions by 45 percent by 2030. G20 countries have a particular responsibility as they represent around 80 percent of emissions. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi met several world leaders on the sidelines of the COP26 summit and discussed the ways to fight the global challenges. 
Modi and his British counterpart Boris Johnson co-chaired the launch of a fund to help small islands developing states build infrastructure to counter the effects of climate change. The initiative aims to provide funds to create disaster resilient infrastructure in island nations vulnerable to rising sea levels and natural disasters worsened by global warming such as Fiji, Jamaica and Mauritius whose leaders also attended the launch. Securing money for poorer nations to help them cut emissions and adapt to the effects of climate change is one of the hot topics at the UN climate talks. Developed countries confirmed they had failed to meet a pledge made in 2009 to provide 100 billion US dollars a year in climate finance by 2020. Instead, it would arrive in 2023. COP26 summit was followed by G20 summit in Rome, where the leaders from G20 nations shared a stage to fight against climate change. The world is now aware about severity of the environmental changes, which can be fought together. Moving on, the young women in Afghanistan are feeling insecure about their future since the takeover by the Taliban. The hardliner Taliban wants women to stay under at home and have restricted them to not work and get educated in schools. However, women here are desperate to get back to their classes and work. We have this report. To fill her days and keep her mind occupied, University student Hawa draws sketches and posts over books in her Kabul home. Like hundreds of thousands of other Afghan girls and young women, the 20-year-old Russian literature undergraduate has not been allowed to return to her studies since the Taliban seized power in mid-August. And like many of her peers, she is feeling a mixture of frustration and anger that her aspirations to study and work are being thwarted. The hardline Islamist Taliban movement, which stormed to power earlier this year after ousting the Western backed government, has allowed all boys and younger girls back to class but has not let older girls attend secondary school. Most public universities are not functioning at all or only partially. Officials have tried to assure Afghans and foreign donors that people's rights will be honoured, including allowing girls to go to school and women to study and work, once details on how to do so in accordance with Islamic law are thrashed out. They have also blamed the international community for cutting off aid, making it harder to fund the reopening of schools and universities for all. Across town, 17-year-old Seher is also stuck at home. She wants to become an engineer, but for now at least, has to learn at home as best she can. بسیار علاقه من داشتم که ما روزا برگردم بیام به سنفم دیگه دوباره درسای ما شروع کنم دیگه ام سنفیایم باشه ام رای مستادای ما دوباره درسای ما شروع شود دیگه بتونیم به درسای ما ادامه بدیم تا که پیشرفت کنیم بتونیم به کشور ما خدمت کنیم More than three months into their rule that has not happened and some are skeptical of a group that when it was last in power from 1996 to 2001, banned all girls from school and women from paid employment. 
Fewer than 40% of Afghan girls attended secondary school in 2018, even though it was allowed then, according to the most recent figures from UNESCO. Much of the country remains deeply conservative, despite 20 years of Western-backed rule and billions of dollars in foreign aid aimed partly at promoting equality and civil rights. But in urban centres in particular, girls and women have enjoyed greater freedom since 2001 and they are reluctant to let them go. Actually, we are working on a very comprehensive mechanism uh, to uh, restart and reopen girls' schools and girls' uh, madrasas and university, so all these things. With each passing day, Afghanistan as a whole dips deeper into poverty. With economic assets frozen and little diplomatic recognition from the outside world, the UN estimates that 97% of the 38 million will plunge into destruction by mid-2022 without urgent action from the outside world. And needless to say, it is almost always the women and girls who will suffer the haunting repercussions. Moving on. Illegally occupied Gilgit Baltistan has been grappling with inflation for long. The cost of almost all items has touched a new high. People are struggling to fulfill their basic needs with the income they earn through their menial jobs. Protests have been going on for a long time across the cities of Gilgit Baltistan. Having reached saturation, people are not ready to call it a day this time. Have a look. <laughs> A large number of locals and people from different political groups staged a massive protest against the government in the illegally occupied Gilgit Baltistan and demanded an immediate check on the exponential rise in inflation. Joined in by different political parties, they called the current dispensation a failure and said it had only brought misery to the people of Gilgit Baltistan. Locals blamed that a policy paralysis in Islamabad coupled with unscrupulous intent of the Imran Khan government was responsible for the current situation where both the retail and wholesale inflation had touched a historic high. Opposition leaders including the former CM of Gilgit Baltistan lamented what he said was an unfolding crisis where every single resident of Gilgit Baltistan was staring at a state manufactured catastrophe. <laughs> The prices of staple food including sugar, wheat flour and pulses have skyrocketed in the past few months in Gilgit Baltistan. Domestic budgets have been severely hit due to sharp rise in the fuel, food and transportation costs. People say they are barely making their ends meet. The inflation rate has touched the double-digit mark in Pakistan too, but it is particularly high in the illegally occupied regions. <laughs> Pakistan 
गरीबों के नाम से ये हुकूमत हासिल किया गया था लेकिन गरीब इनके जमाने में दो ढाई तीन सालों में गरीब गरीब होता गया है अमीर अमीर होता गया While Pakistan has been witnessing economic challenges owing to its incompetent policies, the Gilgit-Baltistan region, which is already marginalized, has borne the major brunt of high inflation. Experts say the economic decline being faced by Pakistan due to its own falls is being compensated by its illegally occupied territories of GB and POK. and the sudden escalation in the prices could be one aspect of the design the employment opportunities are diminishing in gilgit baltistan and the price index has gone up this comes as a major blow to the people of the region whose lives were already battered by a systematic discrimination being meted upon them by occupier islamabad <laughs> And now in our section of Asia this week the story is from across the continent that hit the headlines this week Thailand has become one of the first destinations in Asia to open up to tourists to rescue its battered economy while the country is still averaging around 10000 new covid-19 infections a day It began with the Phuket Sandbox back in July, a bold experiment to allow unvaccinated tourists without quarantine. After a successful trial at the island which brought in revenue and saw no spike in infections from abroad, the scheme was extended to neighboring resorts. Now from November 1, the whole country is being opened up to travelers who meet basic conditions. Vaccinated travelers from countries not on the list can also visit, but much like the original Sandbox, they have to spend first week in bangkok or one of 16 other designated tourist areas before being allowed further afield officials believe this move has a greater bearing on people's livelihood kikuman a leading soy sauce company in japan has acquired the majority of global market It functions quite similarly to Japanese traditional food culture, fermentation and ensures the natural brewing of kikuman soy sauce. The traditional Japanese brewing process known as honjozo is used in the making of this soy sauce. Kikuman soy sauce is honjozo soy sauce, which means naturally brewed soy sauce. And what naturally brewed we use only four natural ingredients and using the power of a microorganism to ferment those ingredients namely soybeans wheat salt and water so just four ingredients so quite simple but actually taste is very very complex uh, that fermentation is very interesting process and uh, with fermentation uh we achieve soy sauce uh, now has a uh, five basic taste all of them uh which is saltiness sweetness sourness bitterness and umami and also in terms of uh, aroma we uh, actually kikuman soy sauce has more than 300 aromatic compounds so it's quite complex So it's the uh, very interesting part of Honjozo soy sauce. The speciality of the natural fermentation method is that it maintains the taste that cannot be attained by chemical seasoning. Soy sauce is majorly used in Japanese traditional cuisine. Kikuman's natural fermentation soy sauce makes the food more delicious. Japanese people enjoy gardening as a hobby in their leisure time. Recently the latest gardening products were exhibited at the International Garden Expo held near Tokyo. This year's expo featured tools used in gardening, ideal products to beautify your garden and various eco-friendly products. 
This is the dome house that can be installed in the garden, enabling owners to create their own special place. おうち時間が、あの、増えたっていうこともあって、あの、皆さん家庭でガーデニングをする機会が増えたっていうことでですね、あの、非常にあの、出店製品が幅広くて、郊外にやっぱりこう出て、あの、移住をしたりだとかっ
Diwali is not only significant because of its massive popularity and brilliant displays of fireworks, but also because it symbolizes the victory of light over darkness and of knowledge over ignorance. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.